<laughs> okay, let's uh, let's let's talk about John now. Um, just based on on what you already know about about John, about the gospel, and it, I, I'm working with the assumption you may not know anything at all, and that's fine. What what are some of the assumptions or just thoughts you have about about John. Now we talked a little bit about it last week, so if you were here last week, you know you, we went through some background. We'll go through it again. Uh, but what what are some of the your assumptions or thoughts about the fourth gospel? What do you know about the fourth gospel? I think that the first verse is actually the first verse of, in time chronology of the Bible. Okay. You know, um, starting out from. When there was just God and Jesus. Okay. So the first verse is, is important mm -hmm. and something we don't see in the other Gospels. Right. Uh, right. We, okay. Good. Good. Because we're going to be looking at that okay. today. Uh, what else? Any, any just thoughts? And if you don't, if you don't have, that's fine. Because we're going to, you will at the end. I will guarantee you. Well, he baptized with water. Okay. And, you know, um, and he, all, he also told them that he wasn't... Well, was, yeah. now I'm talking about the evangelist John, oh, the, okay. not not the Baptist John. Oh, I'm talking okay. about the 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 writer of the book. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, what, uh, and just in general about the fourth about the fourth gospel. He does a lot of says one thing, but it means another. Thing. Okay, and we'll talk <laughs> well, about that. Called. Yeah, Why well, it, it, yeah. so that's I that's irony. irony. We see irony. a lot of irony, we'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, well, let's let's then talk about that um, as we as we look at as we look at John, and I'm just going to give you some some background information that you can file away. I think it's I think it's legitimate and sound. Mo, you know, I, mo, I think it's sound, um, and and a little bit about how we're going to approach uh, John. Uh, the even though it's called the gospel, the gospel according to John, the author is really unknown. And the reason I say the author is unknown is these works, the Gospels, were circulating before they had names. So it wasn't like the first person that got the Gospel of Luke. It said, oh, Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke is in, different because his, the name is in the book itself. You know, it says Luke. But the other three aren't. There's no name in the, in the book itself. The names were given later were attributed to these works later as they were being circulated. So unless you can find a name in the work itself, then there's some question about who actually wrote it. Now, as we go through, so I'm going to talk about John and, you know, what did John write? So I'm going to use John as the writer, as long as you, you're aware that the, the author really isn't, isn't known. The only reason I mention it, and I've done this in other studies, people have had people say, "Well, I think you're, you're undermining the Bible." That's you know, that's that's not what the Bible. I believe in the Bible. That's fine. You know, the the Bible doesn't say John. You know, that was the title given later, and it's like you know, doing things with verses. You know, the verses were added in the 18th century. That's pretty late. You know, that wasn't part of the original. They didn't have chapters and verses. You know, so if you want to get mad about it, okay, but they just weren't there in the ancient versions. Um, with um, if I've I've all I've heard people say you trust John and Matthew first, and Mark and Luke second, because Matthew and John were apostles, and Mark and Luke weren't. Therefore, John is firsthand information. This is things he saw. I think I, I think that's a real slippery slope. Because since we don't know who the writer is, you know, to say, well, he's an apostle, therefore I read John first. I, I, I think you could get into to trouble. And I think you're kind of misusing what the early church and what the church has always believed about the Bible, that everything in scripture is equally inspired. Some isn't more inspired than others. So you have to look at it all sort of on the same level. Uh, but anyway, um, it's if you look at the four Gospels, John is really un unique of the four. The three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they're called synoptic Gospels because they're so, so similar. All three of them seem to be kind of based on Mark uh, with other material. But that's not the case 
in, in John. I mean, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the whole, their whole gospel is Jesus going to Jerusalem one time. In John, he goes there three times. So it's, it's, it's really, really very different. In the others, he cleanses the temple in his only trip to Jerusalem. In John, we're going to see next week, he cleanses the temple right at the beginning of the gospel. So we're, we're looking at you know, s- some similar traditions, but sometimes placed in, in, put in different places. So John seems to be drawing from a lot of his own sources. Uh, as opposed to Matthew, Mark, and Luke that seem to use common sources. There's a lot of parallels between them, not so much in the Gospel of John. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of introduce this today. I uh, mentioned it last week. There's a pattern in the Gospel of John, and I think it's really, really neat uh, that the, the Word comes down, comes down, lives on earth, and then returns. So you've got this kind of pattern. And it's, it's really interesting, in, in and, and we'll see it today about the word coming down. But at the end, Jesus will, and he'll do this in the third chapter, will talk about being lifted up on the cross. That's how he described being lifted up on the cross. And when you think about that pattern coming down and then going back up, at least in John, the cross is beginning the journey back up. You know, so it's the cross and the way John deals with the cross is very different than the others. It's not a place of abandonment and suffering. You know, it's part of glorification. You know, this is the beginning of glorification. He's going back home. And so that that view is is unique in John. You don't see that in, in the others. Uh, mentioned it last week. Again, something to file away. Uh, and we're going to come back to it over and over again. So I introduce it now, but you'll hear it a lot. Uh, John has a unique view of time, and particularly our relationship with God in time. If you look at everybody else who's writing in the New Testament, their view of time is is very horizontal. And, And we tend to have a horizontal view of time. Time has a beginning. Time has an end. You know, past, this is where I am. Past is here. Future is here. You know, we have a very horizontal view of time. That's what the other evangelists, and we've kind of talked about it. The Jesus, and each of them, to varying degrees, has Jesus in the center of that horizontal line. You know, we've had the Old Testament, like Matthew and and Mark, have Old Testament, boom, Jesus, and then new. You know, Luke has a little weird period in the middle of Jesus and John the Baptist. Paul kind of has an overlap you know, we have the past and then Jesus and then his return and then the future. And there's a time of overlap, but all of them are horizontal. That's not the way John views time at all. That's not how time is viewed in John at all. Uh, now, there'll be little allusions to it because he's not stupid. He recognizes as a past and a present and future. But principally, his view of time is vertical. And when I say vertical, everything is related to how you respond to God now. And, and that's something really important to keep in mind. The other ones, your response to God now influences your future. That's not the case in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, every minute you have the opportunity to respond to God. And I may respond to God appropriately now, but that doesn't mean I'm going to respond to God the same way in an hour. On the other hand, I may reject Jesus right now. But in an hour, I may respond in a different way. That's why John and John, there'll be statements made that you know you look at and you you try to squeeze it into this horizontal business, and you it, it leads to kind of some confusion. Jesus will say the judgment is now. The judgment of the world is now. Well, you say, oh well, then it's predestined. Well, it may be, but that's not what he's talking about. The judgment is now. How do you respond to Jesus Christ if you accept him? You're a son of son or daughter of God. If you reject him, you're not. But you may accept him in five minutes. Then you may reject him in an hour. So it is, it's this constant vertical relationship you have with God. Now, God is in control. Therefore, how you respond affects you now. But he will bring in sort of eternity into that. That's something else. When you see eternal life in John, you know, we think of eternal because we got this horizontal view. 
Eternal life means life, if I'm standing here and I'm on this line, eternal life would be where? Here, yeah. right? Because we're on a horizontal line. That's not the way it is in John. Uh, if you look at how he defines eternal life, and that's in chapter 17, verse 3, and this is Jesus talking, because they ask him, what is eternal life? And Jesus says that you know the Father and the one whom the Father sent. Now, present tense. And so eternal life is experiencing the reality of God when? Now. now, that's eternal life. Now, if you look at other places, like in Paul, that's kind of the way he views righteousness, is being in a right relationship with God now. So eternal life in John is very similar to what Paul writes about, only he calls it righteousness. Same concept, different words. But since we're kind of horizontal, we see eternal life and we're thinking about it in the future. And that's not, what, that's not what's going on here. It's what's happening right now. Right now. So Once even something like eternal life. That's exactly yeah, right. Like and that, that's exactly right. It, and, and if you kind of unpack it, and remember, remember we are talking about a different language and translating one language into another. As he writes about it, he, he's saying it's like experiencing eternity when? Now. now. It's experiencing eternity now. That's eternal life. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what he, that's what, when Jesus says that, we need to be aware of that. I, I, I noticed when I defined eternal life, what I did, and this is what you know, I would encourage you to do. You don't, when, when you run into terms like eternal life, you don't open Webster's and says, ooh, life means this, eternal means this, that must mean what Jesus meant. Well, Jesus didn't have Webster's, so Jesus didn't do that. You know, so we've got, if we want to find out what a word or term means, we have to do what? You have to know what it meant then. Yeah, we got to know what it meant, and in particular, what it meant in the book. So if, if in the Gospel of John, Jesus says he talks about eternal life somewhere else, like defining it, that's eternal life. Doesn't matter what Webster said. That's eternal life. And, and fortunately with that, he does define it in, in the work. So we want to be, we want to look at that. Mentioned that um, there's irony uh, all over the place in, in uh, Gospel of John, and the irony tends to be the same way. The, the reader, we know, we know the truth, and people are constantly responding in the wrong way. You know, the woman at the well, you know, Jesus talks about giving her living water, and the woman responds by saying, you don't have a bucket. You don't have a bucket. And we, the reader, say, what are you talking about, woman? He's not dealing with water. He's dealing with something greater. That's an ironic statement. Nicod he says to Nicodemus, and that's a play on words. So he says, you've got to be born from above or born again. It's a little play on words he's using. And Nicodemus says, now how can I return to my mother's womb and be born? You know, and we think, geez, are you the dumbest man around? Of course he's not talking about that. He's talking about something deeper. That's irony. And, and John is it's constant. We're going to see him what we look at today. You know, he uses irony all the time. This is something that is just, just part of his writing technique. Um, if we look at the gospel, and again, this is just sort of background. Look at the gospel of John. There are, there are very few miracles. I mean, geez, are the other ones. There are miracles all the time. Sometimes it's just, he healed a lot of people. You know, they don't even know how many there were. You know, he's just healing people. Very few miracles in the gospel of John. And the other ones, they're, he's still, they're still establishing that he's God. Right. Where John tells us right off, so he doesn't have anything to prove. Well, and John, and, and yes, and, and John, exactly, is, is working on something different. It, miracles don't enhance the point John wants to make. You know, that's, that's miracles almost get in the way. And we're going to see today a, a birth story would get in the way of John's gospel. You know, so he's not going to, he's not going to do that because he, he wants his reader to take something else away from who Jesus Christ is. So he doesn't have miracles. He doesn't have parables uh, in, in the gospel of John. They're just on. And when we read the others, you know, Jesus taught in parables. You know, that was a big deal. But we don't have them at all in John. You know, which is which is also interesting. Interesting with the miracles, though. But John, where the other ones say, or have a very negative view of signs, John doesn't. John talks a lot about signs. 
Uh, and we're, we're just talking about different people writing about the same reality, you know, and the importance of the same person. They're just taking, he's just taking a different perspective on it. Maybe the most important thing of all in John is Jesus is in control uh, in John. Uh, we, we looked at Mark in detail. At the end of Mark, man, it seems like he's gotten out of control. Jesus has lost control when they arrest him and they're carting him from one place to another. And, it's, and then at the end, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, it seems like things have just gotten out of control, gotten out of hand. If you've, if you've ever heard Jesus Christ Superstar, that's what Judas says. When do things get so out of hand in one of his songs? That's what we get from the other gospels. That's never the case in the Gospel of John. Jesus is always in control in John, uh, right up to the cross. They only arrest him, able to arrest him, because everybody falls down. When the soldiers come to arrest him, they all fall on the ground. And he allows himself to be arrested. He carries the cross by himself. John says that, carries it by himself in the garden before his, his arrest. He, in his prayer, he says, you know, what should I pray? That this cup pass from me? Well, of course I wouldn't pray that. That's why I came. Uh, you know, so it's, I think John knew the other gospels, or at least one of them, and knew they were saying, you know, well, Jesus was struggling with, you know, going to the cross at the end. My God, you know, let this cup pass. Well, in the gospel of John, he says, should I pray that? Well, no, of course I'm not going to pray that. That was my mission. You know, and I'm going to do what I was sent to do. And that's why on the cross, his last words aren't, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or to you, I release my spirit. His word, last words on the cross in John is simply, done. yeah, it's done. It's, done. it's finished. Uh, because his job is finished. You know, now he's ready to go home. You know, now he can go home. He has done what he was sent to do. And, and so the perspective is very different. And that's why... We want to stick in. That's why moving John into the other Gospels, or worse, moving the other Gospels into John, man, that really muddies the water and gets things very confused because they're so very different in, in how they see the importance of Jesus Christ. And remember, that's what we're looking at. Why is Jesus Christ important? Why is he important to us? And John is going to tell us from his perspective why he's important. I think when you put all the Gospels together, you see all the parts of Jesus. Yes, I think so. Without, you know, if you look at this, you're focused only on this part. And when you add John to it, it expands who Jesus is. Absolutely. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Uh, and that's, that's why you, and you look at him separately. And when you look at him separately and say, oh, this is showing us how Jesus is like us. And that's what we leave with Mark. You know, Jesus suffered just like us. Mm -hmm. He can really identify with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say, my gosh, isn't that wonderful to have a Savior who knows our pain? You know, that's in Hebrews. You know, we can pray to him and he knows. The high priest home knows our pain. Boy, that's wonderful. John, Jesus cannot identify with us in John because well, Jesus knows he control. is. Yeah. I like knowing God's in control. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So when you go to God, when you go to Jesus and pray to Jesus, you're praying to somebody who God. isn't like you, no. who is God. greater God. than you. you. You're talking about God. And that's also important to recognize about who he is. And, and this is something he knows right at the beginning. Uh, there's a song, one of my favorite pieces, 20th century pieces, is a piece by Leonard Bernstein called The Mass. <laughs> And in part of the Mass, they sing, it's, it's people become disgusted with the liturgical nature of the Catholic Church. And uh, they, in essence, in one of the songs, they say, don't, don't tell me that Jesus knows me. Because he knew he had to live, he knew he had to die, and he knew he was going back to God. He knew it. So don't tell, tell me that he, he can understand me, because I don't know any of those things. You know, my life is complex. I don't know what to do. At times, I have no clue what to do. And I am scared to death of the future. I am scared to death of the future. But he wasn't, because he knew. So don't say that he can understand me. Well, that's, that's what John is saying. Mark, on the other hand, says, oh, yeah, he can understand you, because he died all alone on a cross. So he knows exactly what fear is, because he felt it. 
And, and both of those things are necessary to understand what, not, not just who Jesus is, but maybe more importantly, why Jesus is important, why the Messiah is important. I think it's also important because it allows you to have the feelings that you have and they're not wrong. Yeah, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we, he kind of unifies. Well, he, he does because he does something that you can't find. Uh, he, he, you've got a person that can identify with us completely and can also do something about it. And that, when I, when I teach, there was a, uh, a great theologian, and, and I'm mentioning his name only because, you know, to just say a great theologian seems kind of odd. Uh, the, his name was Karl Barth. And I, in my, when I teach about Reformed faith, I use him a lot. Uh, he believed that God, that God was perfect, and his perfection can come down to two parts. God is perfect in his freedom, and God is perfect in his love. Both are perfect. Well, we're not perfect in either one. And we're not even close. In fact, we're limited, constantly limited. And you can't understand how God can be perfect in both, because how can you be perfect in justice and perfect in mercy? Well, that we can't be. You know, so our justice is tempered with mercy and our mercy is tempered with justice. That's not the case with God. God is perfect in both. Well, how can you be perfect in both? I don't know, but God is, which means God is greater than me. And I can't really understand him. I can, come, I can kind of come close, get in the neighborhood, but I can't understand his nature because he's, I'm God. not God. God. You know, I'm not God. And that's a good thing because when I am really confused and scared, there's someone who is greater than me in control of creation. And, and I think that's what we see, what you're saying when we compare the Gospels. We've got this, this good contrast in who Jesus is, both of which are true. In human terms, absolutely impossible. In divine terms, all, all things, things are possible. Are possible. All things are possible. So, I, and, and I want you to do that. And, and I think when you do that, you, you, you kind of relax a little bit. And now you allow the gospel to speak to you instead of trying to fit it in. Well, how does this work? Well, you know, Mary and Joe, where does Mary and Joseph fit into John? Well, they don't. And you don't worry about it. You know, it's not important. You know, you don't, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about it. You know, if you do, I think you're kind of wasting time. But if you want to waste time, that's fine. I waste a lot of time. You know, I don't think you're going to get any answers. Uh, you just let the gospel speak. Okay, speaking of letting the gospel speak, let's, let's sort of introduce ourselves into John by doing this, uh, as Donna was talking about, this wonderful prologue. And that's what it is in, in the gospel of John. And when you look at the first chapter, right at the beginning of the first chapter, as it's, and I think in most of the translations you're looking at, maybe not, uh, how is it, how is it structured on a page? What does it look like on a page? In a lot of translations, it looks like poetry. It, oh. Now, you may be looking at something that has paragraphs. Um, I, that's probably, if I were going to do it, I probably wouldn't put it in paragraphs because it's really more poetic in nature. And, and we read poetry different than we read paragraphs, don't we? How do we read poetry? If you're looking at a poem versus a, a story, line. how do you read it different? You read a line and you stop. And you read a line and you stop. And you read a line and you stop. Why do you do that? With, with, a, with a poem, why would you read a line? And it may be a line that you know, doesn't immediately make sense. Why would you read a line and then kind of pause and think, oh, think about it? Because... Maybe all the lines don't say the same thing and you have to give it time to sink in. Okay. You, you, the way it's written, you want to do it slowly because things are going on that may not, you know, maybe a little deeper than if you were looking at things, a story and in a book. poetry doesn't tell you the story. It gives you the hint and then you have to add to it. Okay. And, and how is it giving you hints? What, what would be in a poetic line that would give you hints? What, what would we expect when we looked at, at the words in, in poetry as opposed to, 
they're to Mary. They're, okay, good. They're more flowery, symbolic. You know, you're looking at the images. Uh, my, fa- my favorite poem in the entire world is by a man named T.S. Eliot, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And he talks about, he, should, he says in the poem, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across silent seas. Now, what is he talking about? If he were writing prose, what would he say? I should have been a what? Sailor. A pair, a pair of ragged claws scuttling across floors of silent seas. What is he describing? A mouse. Or right. silent, silent seas, ragged claws scuttling across silent seas. What's crab? A crab, a crab or a lobster. I should have been a crab or a lobster down in the bottom of the bottom of the ocean. I mean, that's what he's saying, but he doesn't say. If he were writing narrative, he says, sometimes I feel like I'm not worth anything more than a crab because he wants people to understand it. But he'll use this flower. He, sa- he says, uh, I, I measured out my life in coffee spoons. <laughs> you know, well, the, you know, we say that. Well, he didn't literally do it, but shows how empty his life is. That he, all he does, you know, his life can be measured in the amount of coffee he drank at these little parties and teas and stuff he went to. A, a very shallow life. That's what a poet does. Somebody who writes a short story doesn't do it because he wants us to, to get the story. To get the story. If he does that, we're going to look at it and say, I don't know what he's talking about here. You know, so anyway, so we're going to approach it looking for symbolic language. We're going to be looking for something deeper than maybe what's going on in the words. So as we approach it, now at the very beginning, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. How does it start? In the beginning. beginning. Oh, man, I am having deja vu all over again. Genesis. Genesis. Whoa. In the beginning. Now, if, if, now we could, you could say, well, that's just a coincidence. If you're, when you're interpreting scripture, that is a bad habit to fall into. Because everything could be a coincidence, you know. So you never assume that something is unintended. You know, if something seems like, I'm an Occam's razor guy. If it looks like, it, the most obvious answer is usually the right one. You know, if this looks like Genesis, I, I'm, I may be safe John in assuming that John is playing on Genesis. This is sort of rewriting, you know, in his way, the Genesis story that's appropriate for his gospel about who Jesus is. Well, by doing this, he's putting Jesus before the beginning uh-huh. of physical. Right. And that way, all the things that he does is more important than the physical. Right. I, I, I think so. Because he says in the next line, he says, in the beginning, what? Was the word, word. Was, word was, was with God. Was the word. Okay, the logos. That's the Greek word for love, the logos. In the beginning was word. Now what, if he uses it, and remember he's sort of writing poetry here, so we're, we're looking for, for images. What, what would we assume? Because if we say word, word, my page is covered with words. I mean, these words weren't at the beginning. So what is... Okay, the speaker, the, one of the interesting things you see when you look at, at the Old Testament, the, the two words, logos and sophia, good, another good Greek word, is associated with God. And in particular, God's creative process. In other words, when you think about the mind of God, you're thinking about the logos, the word. You're thinking about Sophia, the wisdom of God. And, and remember, Logos has a meaning for the Greek far more than just a word on a page. That's why biology, which has biologos, has logos at the end. Geology, anthropology, all have logos because they're all the study of. Uh, so it's more than just words on a page. So the word is, well, we're going to find out. So in the beginning was this word, you know, was this word. And he tells us some stuff about, about the word, right? What does he tell us about the word? That the word was God. The word was with God and the was, word was God. was God. Now, how can we take both those together? Was with God and was God? It's beginning and the end. Okay. Ken, Ken, look at it at the beginning and the end. You know, Alpha and Omega. 
as certainly different aspects of God, okay? And at the beginning, when and, and where were, was the word? With God. In the beginning, with God. Okay, so we know right now, we got the God and the word, as he says, in the beginning, there already was God and the word. At the beginning. Yeah, yes, at the beginning. You know, right. Now, what, what does the word Again, following this poem, what does this word, and we're, John hasn't introduced us yet to what the, what the word is, but he, he's about to. What does the word do? Makes all things. Okay, he makes all things. So the word becomes the creative power of, of God. Man, read, read the fourth chapter of Proverbs. That's, that's what it says. Uh, that's what it says in Proverbs. My gosh, Genesis 1. You know, how does all things come to be? God said, God's word. let there be light. We spoke it yeah, there was light. So this idea of word is, is has, in the Old Testament is associated with this creative process. So any Jew reading this would say, oh, oh would have absolutely no problem with what he's saying. He's not introducing new and radical theology here. This isn't. This is. This is par for the. This is Old Testament sort of wisdom theology. You know that the the God is creating and God creates through his speaking. through the Word. His speaking. His wisdom is that which creates all things. And and in fact, John, because again he's writing poetry, and one of the things you see in poetry, particularly Hebrew poetry, is you repeat things. You know that's called parallel structure. Uh, you repeat it, and he repeats it, right? The everything came into being through the word, and then he repeats it by saying what? Nothing. Without him, nothing came into being, which is saying the exact same thing, which tells us that must be, must be really important. You know, so we've got the word. We know the word is with God. We know the word was God. We know the word is that which God used to create all things, okay? To what aspect then does now John draw our attention? Life and life. Okay, now he starts drawing our attention to something else. So we've got everything with the Jews. Oh yeah, I, I got no problem with that. So he starts bringing our attention to, to life. Now, life is going to be really important as you go through the gospel. Guess with whom life is going to be associated? Jesus. It's going to be associated with Jesus. The way, the truth, and, and Jesus doesn't say, uh, I am the way to the, the truth and the life. He says, I am. I am. I am. And we're going to see that in a little yeah. bit too. He says, I am the life. So right here, you know, John is drawing our attention to life. That's what John, throughout his gospel, is going to associate. The whole gospel of John is introduced in this little, little prologue. This is one of the terms he's going to go back to over and over again, the idea that Jesus is life. And now he, he pushes it even further. What is the life? What is life? The light of people. It is the light of all people. So we've got two terms John introduced. Now we read that and we'd say, I really don't understand what he's talking about. John, I think if John were here, he said, that's okay. You, I, okay? I, got, I, got, I got, yeah, I got, I got 22 chapters. Mm -hmm. I'm going to explain to you. 21 chapters. I'm going to explain to you exactly what I'm talking about. So don't worry. I am introducing ideas that I'm going to develop later. So this one that we call the word that's associated with God, right, is also going to be associated with life, life and light. light. And I'll tell you, he loves, John loves to play with light and dark. Loves to play with light and dark. You know, and light is always going to be going to be God, going to be good, going to be positive. Dark is always going to be yeah. bad, confused, ignorant. You know, that's what he does. Man, that's what John does. And it's interesting at creation, the first thing he did was bring light. Bring light. Well, and, and when you look at the, the first, and, and, and at this is well, kind of related to this. In Genesis, you know, you got two creation stories. you got two creation stories. Uh, written different times because they call God by two different names in the two creation stories. 
Um, so probably drawn from different at different times. Certainly has a different mindset. That first creation story is probably a later one, and that's in, in first chapter, where you've got this incredibly structured creation, you know, that God calls into being. And then in chapter two and chapter three, you have a more basic, you know, creation where, you know, it's, it's being brought out of dry land. So you have these two really different, very different. One God is called Elohim, the other one he's called that name, four-letter name for God. You know, it's it, one, he walks around, you know, he's more human in the second story. In the first one, he's kind of cosmic. You know, it's, it's, it's just different. They're just different. They knew it was different. They included both because both do what? Show a facet of God. That's right. Tell us something about God and tell us something about creation. You know, both of them are necessary to understand what creation is, you know. And can we understand it completely? No. Why can't we understand it completely? Not when I God. You know, when we get to be God, and let me know when that happens to you, <laughs> uh, because then I'll call a friend of mine and they will take talk to you. Away. They'll take you away. <laughs> but you'll be happy. Uh, the, um, but, yeah, so, and, and so we, you know, that's, that's there, but the, the first one, it seems far more uh, in line with sort of the later wisdom stuff by the language used in it. You know, it seems more, and that's, that's kind of later he, Jewish theology well, is, it, is this it's like. It's also you know. the physical creation where the other is God's interaction with man. Right. You know, as opposed to just making them and having them there. Excellent. And sometimes we may want to look at that, Genesis. Uh, one is a story about creation. The other one is a story of man. Because in the, the first creation story, human beings are created on what day? Six. Day six, which is the last day. And in fact, they are the last creation of the last day. And in Genesis 2, human beings are created when? Right at the beginning, before anything else is made. Uh, you know, so one is a story of humans because humans are created first. The other is story of creation where humans are created last. And, and I mean, it's just which one's right and which one's wrong, but they're both stories. You know, they're stories. It's not right or wrong. You're using a wrong template, you know, to, to apply to a story that isn't about historical geological proof. It's the truth is about who God is, who human beings are. So here he's doing the same thing, and I think that's a great point, that light and darkness we see in the Genesis story, we see here. Only here he's associating light with life. the word. Life with light, light with life and word. Okay, and we're not sure what life and word mean yet, but we're gonna find out later in, in this. Okay, now, what is, and this light, what does John tell us about the light? It shines in the it darkness. Shines in the darkness. We don't understand. Yes, and the, but the darkness... Can I put it out? And, and that's, that's really important, I think, uh, for us to you know, sort of file away. If, if the light, and we're going to see the light's going to be, because Jesus is also going to call himself what? I am the light of the world in John. I am the light of the world. So Jesus is going to call himself light. He's going to call himself light. You know, and way, yeah. Uh, the... Um, uh, the fact that the light can't over, the darkness can't overcome it. John, this is not a struggle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is not a cosmic struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. Who's going to win? God and Satan. Don't know. Got to wait till the last chapter. Wow. Don't know who's going to win. Control. It's over. I mean, it's, there's no competition at all. You know, God's won. God's in control. You know, there are things we don't understand, but it doesn't mean God is in control. And, and what he's saying here is, man, it's not like the darkness may take, overcome the light, because it's not. You know, the light overcomes the darkness, period, end of discussion. Well, why do things happen the way they do? Don't know yet. Let's find out. Okay, so we've got, we've got the light in the dark. We've got light established, associated with word. Uh, now we've kind of got a, a, a little... Um, We've got a, a, a little shift, right, in verse 6. Because who's introduced in verse 6? Okay, now we've got John the Baptist. 
And I'm going to try to call him, I only have to do it for a couple of chapters, John the Baptist, uh, two, two chapters. I'm calling him, I'll call him the Baptist because I don't want to confuse him with awesome. the evangelist, John. You know, so, so the Baptist, uh, what, why is it important? Now, what, do we, what does he say about the Baptist? He was sent by God. He was a man sent by God, which means he is, carries a... An anointing. I, yeah, an anointing. Okay. So he's someone sending God, remembering that God is in control. control. Therefore, God is sending John. John just doesn't, the Baptist doesn't show up with special insight. Well, he's sent by is God. Is it in Matthew that it tells about how he was born? You know, he's Luke. Special, Luke. Yeah, Luke. Luke uh, tells about it, a special birth. Right. So. <laughs> There you go. Uh, you know, God controlled that. And it, and and I want you to and see this stuff really excites me. <laughs> I get really excited about it. Both both Luke, in fact, all the evangelists want, but particularly Luke and John want us to see the Baptist is important. And Luke does it by writing this miraculous birth. John does it by saying, God sent him. The, ba- the Baptist was sent by God, John uh, by God. His birth is irrelevant. He was sent by God. God sent John. And so both in their own way are putting John as important. And I'll tell you, they're going to do the same thing with the incarnation. They, we're going to see that later in this poem. They're going to do the same thing with Jesus. Both want Jesus to be viewed as important, but they're going to set it up in a different way. Okay, so John, and what what is... What's the purpose of the Baptist? What does this, what does this person named John, who's going to be the Baptist, what did he come to do? Witness. Okay, he came to bear witness to the light. The light. Now we're starting to understand what John is, the, the evangelist John is going to associate with the light. He came to bear witness to the light. And what's the goal? So everybody believes. Okay, everybody believes. Now, it's interesting. John the Baptist is going to be a witness to the light. Now, that's, that's a slightly different role than he's going to play in the, the other Gospels. He's going to witness to the light, which we know is going to be Jesus, right? Because Jesus says, I am the light, later. He's going to be a witness so that people believe in Jesus. What in the other Gospels did he come to do? To baptize Jesus. To baptize and to, what did, what's, what's that prophecy from Isaiah? Oh, yeah, to prepare. To prepare the way of the Lord, to make straight his path. You know, his way, his job in the other gospels was to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus is coming. Here, he is actually bearing witness to Jesus. So in one, he's like a prophet that's pointing ahead. In here, he's going to be the one that says, now, now. Remember in the other Gospels, John, well, not in Mark, but in Matthew and Luke, John sends disciples to Jesus and say, really yeah, Christ. are you the one or should we wait for somebody else? So the Baptist doesn't know in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew whether Jesus is the one or not. In, yeah. in John, you can't testify of something. You, you can't testify know. and not know. He knows. John knows. It's interesting. We'll see that next week that John in, in the other Gospels is sort of the last of the great prophets pointing to the future. In the Gospel of John, the he's Baptist the is the first Christian witness. Is the first Christian witness. He's the one that points to Jesus. He's, he's the bridge. Yes, he, he is the bridge. He is the first. You know, that's the Lamb of God. That's the Lamb of God. Okay, so we, we know that. Now, then John says... So he is going to lead people to faith. We'll see that later. This is just introducing ideas. Now, what else does the evangelist say about the Baptist? He's not the light. He, the he is not the light. light. You know, why would he have feel the need to say he's not the light, but came to testify to the light? Well, because you don't want to make him bigger than Jesus. Okay, right. Which is what they kind of, the, in the other Gospels, they struggle with too. You know, particularly since John is going to baptize Jesus. Uh, that makes it well, troublesome. You know, if, what's the relationship between the two? You wouldn't have the greater the, the greater be baptized by the lesser. Mm-hmm. It would seem as though John has authority to, to baptize. And the, diff- the evangelists deal with that in different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here he deals with it right at the beginning 
that, that John is not, the Baptist is not the light. He just bears witness to the light. No confusion. And how is the light described? It true. is the true, true light. light. There's no other light. And uh, again, we got another term that's going to be important later. The term true. And, and so we've got these words that have been introduced. We've got word, and that's not going to be a big deal, but life is, light is, now we've got that word is true. true, true and truth, because Jesus is going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. My gosh, he's going to, so we've got all these words introduced that the evangelist is going to associate with Jesus later. So like I said, everything we need to know is being introduced here you know, in this little prologue. And what is the light going to do? What does the light do? He gives light. He gives light. He enlightens. And what is that, what is that light going to do? What is the word, the truth, the life, the light? What is that light about to do? It's going to come into the world. It's going to come into the world. And again, we got that neat pattern I was saying. You know, here's the word. It is coming into creation, right? And we got that little shift in verse 10 because it says in verse 10, what? He was in the world. Now, we see the same thing in like the Gospel of Luke, only we see it in the second chapter, beginning of the second chapter, when Mary has her baby. You know, has entered the world. And John, he's not going to say, let's not, let's not think about a baby born in Bethlehem. Let's think about the light coming into the world. This is, this is a cosmic event. You know, Luke emphasizes simplicity. There's nothing simple in this, that the light is, is coming into the world. It's interesting that Jesus' birth is the only event in history that has the fireworks of the right. happening from God. Right. You know, the angels sing and the big light and, you know, showing that God coming down was important. This was a big deal. And, and, and John, for John, this is it. This is the light coming into the world. And, and John reminds us, what did the light, the word, the truth, the life, what did it do? It's coming into the world. What was its relationship with the world? Before, what was the relationship between this one that was coming into the world? He, was the he made the world. This was the world that he made, right? So he was entering that which he had made, and yet, how did the world respond? They didn't know. They didn't know. They didn't know. And yet, he made the world, and the world didn't know. What do you call that? Irony. Irony! Irony! Da, 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 da. The very world that he made doesn't recognize it. You know? It's like me not recognizing her. Or her not recognizing me. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we, we've got, he's, he's now in the world. The world doesn't, doesn't know him. And he, again, because this is kind of poetic, so he repeats himself. To whom did he come? He came to, okay, he came into the world, the world didn't know. The world that he made didn't recognize it, didn't know it. Okay, that's bad. That's really bad, isn't it, Patty? That's bad. Mm -hmm. Now he's coming to his own people. Well, my gosh, his own people. Didn't want but they didn't want to, they didn't receive him. They went out oh. They didn't accept him. So we've got the same, we've got the same irony again. You know, not only did the world that he made not know him, but his yeah, own people, people set apart yeah. and were expecting him. Still yes, didn't know him. didn't know him. Now we're going to find out how that works <coughs> out later because he's just introducing these ideas. You know that he's going to develop later in his gospel, but he's he's introducing it right here now. But, which is a powerful word, in verse twelve, but. All who receive. Okay, to all who receive it. And how how are they defined? How does he define? They believe. Okay, those who believe. Now, really important. We want to, we, this word believe. You know, I've told you before when we've looked at like Mark, 
and resurrection and when we looked at Paul, the word Greek word pistis or pistuo can be translated, is often translated trust. And that's what belief is, is trusting. That's not how John uses belief. That's not how he uses pistis or pistuo. It, it seems to be more, less trusting and more accepting. So when you believe in Jesus, and they're not, they're not you know, contradictory. You know, it's just sort of nuances of the same thing. If, if I believe in Jesus for John, I accept Jesus for, who, for whom Jesus says he is. I accept him as God, God light, Words. life, Words. truth, <coughs> word. I'm accepting that he is who he says he is. That seems to be what faith is in John, is accepting who Jesus is. Now, when you accept who Jesus is, then you will do what? You'll trust it, you know. So these aren't, these aren't contradictory. It's where you're going to put the emphasis. You know, John puts the emphasis on the, tr on the accepting side. Paul puts the emphasis on the trusting side. You know, tr faith and trust is sort of the same. Having faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus is the same thing. For John, accepting Jesus and having faith is the same thing. Do you think that's because um, this is being written to people that haven't accepted Jesus yet, so that you can't trust in him and you don't accept what he says. And yet Paul's audience has already accepted Jesus as their Christ, so now they have to trust him. Could be, except the Jesus presented here is, is actually going to be harder to accept because he this is this is going to be the the, the highest view of Jesus. You know, this isn't you know, this, this, this would be the hardest for, for a Jew to accept, this Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, be a real challenge. I, I think it, it could, but it could be. Uh, it may be just that people, different people use the same words in slightly different ways. Uh, and that's why if I want to know how Paul uses it, I look at other places where he uses it. You know, if I want to know how John uses it, I look at other places he uses it. Uh, and I, like I said, they aren't contradictory. Uh, just like I said, when John talks about eternal life, that's a lot. It's it's a lot like how Paul describes righteousness. A, a, a lot like Paul's view of righteousness, his relationship with God. Question: Is John writing to Jews? No, John. Well, that was too strong. John John is writing, and and this we can be. I can be pretty safe in saying. John, they may have been Jews, but John is writing to a community where Christians and Jews have separated. Uh, Matthew and Luke are writing to communities that still have a, mi a mixture of Jews. In fact, Matthew's church are Greek-speaking Jews principally. That's why he uses Old Testament a lot. I mean, if he's writing to Gentiles, they don't care about the Old Testament. They don't care. Uh, but both Matthew and Luke write, use the Old Testament enough that he's writing to people that care about it. So he, they must be people with Jewish backgrounds. Now, they certainly believe in Jesus, but they, they sort of see themselves, but, and maybe even stronger in Luke, because Luke, in the 15th chapter of Acts, is at the Apostolic Council, is going to reinforce some Jewish law. You know, you don't eat carrion, you don't eat roadkill, you don't eat meat with blood in it, you don't eat, you know, you don't eat uh, a food that's been sacrificed to idols. You know, he's going to give, that's Old Testament, that's Old Testament dietary law. So they see themselves as connected to, to Judaism. And that's why when you look at those gospels, the enemies in the, go in the gospel itself, the, the real enemies are the scribes and the Pharisees. They are the enemies. And then the priests come in and the Herodians come in. But it's the scribes and the Pharisees who hate Jesus first. That's not going to be the case in, in John. The group that, John, that will be the enemy, the antagonists, the ones against Jesus, John will call the Jews. The Jews. The Jews are going to be against him. Which tells me, the reader, that John's, the Christians in John Church, they don't see themselves as Jews anymore. You know, and they're separated from this other community that they've identified as Jews. So were they Jews at one time? Probably, mostly, probably, because it's not, it's still a Jewish word. 
you know, it, there's Jewish theology in it, but they don't see themselves as Jews anymore. And it may be because the Jews don't see them as Jews anymore. The Jews have kind of kicked them out and the Jews are persecuting them. Um, it seems like in Matthew, Matthew's almost, you almost see like a struggle within Judaism. You know, uh, is, is Judaism going to become Messianic uh, or is it going to be Pharisaic? Uh, and you, in Matthew and, and Luke, you see that kind of struggle going on. You know, Luke is the importance he puts on the temple. You know, wh which direction is Judaism going to go? Well, we know which direction it went historically. It didn't become Messianic, it became Pharisee. Pharisaic. And the Messianic Judaism disappears and Christianity becomes Greek. So do you think that that's why this statement is there to those who believe in his name? A absolutely, a absolutely. And as just a reminder, and again, he's, these are, these, we're not supposed to read this and say, oh, we understand this completely. These are themes he's going to develop. And so what he's saying is, you know, people rejected him, but understand not everybody, you know, because, you know, Patty, you didn't reject him. No. And the people in that church, y'all didn't reject him. And so those are the people he, I'm, I'm talking to now, the people who did receive it. Uh, so it wasn't like an absolute, because clearly Mark's, John's church exists and people believe. And so he wants to make sure that he's not painting with this great big brush. Everybody rejects him. No, not everybody rejects him. There were plenty who believed in him. Okay, and what by believing, what do you be? What do they become? Children, children of God. Now understand, <laughs> vertical children of God. You're ch a child of God when? When you believe. When you believe. Does that apply to tomorrow? Yes. <gasps> not for John. Because everything is based on your relationship right now. Now, so it's not a, like you don't become a child of God and then you reject him, but you're still a child of God. But that, everybody knowing the story of Jesus would see that it happens just the same to them as it did to him. With, he was a child of God, so we become a child of God. You, you, right, right, right. And, and it's, it's almost like we, we want to say, you're acting like a child of God. Mm -hmm. You assume that role. Well, if I'm a child of my father, you know, I'm a child of my father. If, and I guess in one sense, I'm always going to be a child of my father. But if I don't treat my father like a father, then... You've severed the relationship. Yeah, I've kind of severed the relationship. Now, I might reestablish a relationship the next day, but I've kind of severed it now. And that's, I think, and I'm thinking out loud now. So, you know, be careful because my mind is drifting. Uh, I, I think that's kind of what he has in mind. That what's, what's important is if you trust, you can be confident you're a child of God. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. If you trust today, you know you're a child of God. There's enough troubles for today. Yeah, God's exactly. And if you, don't, if you don't trust tomorrow, you don't care about being a child of God. You know, if you don't trust tomorrow, it doesn't matter because you don't trust. You don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. So it becomes almost an irrelevant term. Uh, and, and that's kind of what, what's going on. But he's going to explain all of this later. Okay, so uh, again, we, we become a child. And he says, uh, how would they describe those children of God? They're not natural. History. They're not born. They're not Human from blood. Decision. Yeah, it's not the will of man. God. Instead, you become a child of God because of God. God. Okay, why God? Because God is in control. control. Okay, now, what does the word do? Then, now we're born. getting into it. Now he becomes flesh and lived among us. Now, what are we talking about when he says? Because he talked about the light coming into the world and the life and the oh da 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 da. Now he's getting concrete, right? In verse fourteen, what what does he start describing? This this light, this life, this word. You know, this truth becomes what physical becomes flesh. Now, why is that so important that the word becomes flesh? Because if he can't read, he isn't flesh, he doesn't really pass. Doesn't He becomes a concept. All he is is a concept. You know, sort of like, you know, Buddhist truth, you know, which is wonderful. But it's a concept. It's an idea. Jesus isn't 
an idea. The light isn't just an idea. The idea that Jesus is real. is real. The word becomes flesh. Now, how does how does Matthew and Luke describe the word word becoming flesh? They say the, the same birth, thing. The because Jesus is born. You know, he becomes flesh because the son is born. How does Mark describe? Because Mark, I think, does describe how the how the how the son becomes flesh. In the Gospel of Mark, you remember? Because Mark has no has no birth story. Mark has no prologue like here. But remember when Jesus is baptized, first time we see Jesus, what happens? The dove comes down. Heaven's ripped apart, dove comes down. I think that becomes, for Mark, incarnation. Okay. Incarnation in Mark. Now, which one is right and which one is wrong? First option. Doesn't, doesn't matter. You know, that's, they're just different ways well, to describe. Exactly. They're ways to describe the exact same thing. And what John is choosing to do is he's describing it in cosmic, universal terms. You know, not a baby in a manger. He is describing the word becoming flesh. Jeez. You know, that's... Goose Whoa. That's, mm-hmm. that's pretty. How, how does he do that? Not explained. Why is it not explained? Can't be explained. You know, because that limits God. Mm-hmm. That m- limits this cosmic event. But what does, what does the flesh reveal? That he dwells with us. Okay, well, what does John say? Why does that, the, why does that flesh become so important? Because what, what does the flesh do for us, according to John? Still in verse 14. It's just feeling love. Okay, but we can, we can feel love. What else can we feel? We, we can live we, what can we see free. because of the flesh? Because, we can see the glory of God because he comes, becomes flesh. Now, that kind of makes sense. Because if I've got to see the glory of God through a concept, it's pretty. That's pretty hard to see. Wispy. Yeah, but God, we can see the glory of God because it's concrete. Because it's concrete, and and coming in a way that we can understand. Understand. It's in a way that we can understand. That's why having acquiring our limits becomes so important. But that's what John says, and this is all in this prologue is all part of God's plan and intention. You know, so this isn't, he's not, Jesus doesn't come and just play it by ear. This is everything we're seeing that all of this that Jesus will do is part of the plan. The plan. Okay. You wouldn't be able to accept it or understand it if it all was dumped on you one time. Nor could we understand it if, let me tell you the concept. Let me tell you the concept of God. Well, thank you. If we had an explanation of how it happened, then God didn't do it. If we could grasp. If we had a way we understood what had happened, then God didn't do it. Yeah. Because I can understand how paper's made. Not, I can't do it, but I can understand how paper's made. But I can't understand how Jesus was made. Right. Because it's not the normal way. How the word became flesh. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I, I think that is exactly, and, and John wants to make sure his audience knows that, you know, that there's this, this separation. But still, that if we accept Jesus for who he is, we have the opportunity to have this new relationship, this different, this sonship relationship with God. Shifts in verse 14. So we know the, the word has entered human space, in a human way, it's come to reveal all these you know, characteristics we're gonna see associated with Jesus, things like light and truth and life. Interesting though with grace, uh, this in the Gospel of John, in this chapter one is the only time he uses the word for grace, curious. That's fascinating to me, I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why, but it's the only time he uses grace. Grace would seem to be pretty important here, but he never uses it again in the Gospel. I don't know why. Paul uses it all over the place. All over the place. Gospel of Luke, well, all over the place. But grace isn't something he uses. Something that God gives, but we don't deserve. Yeah. 
So we didn't deserve know. Christ coming to, to become flesh. Now that would be something as someone who studies the Bible. When I look at it and I say he uses grace here, so I open up and find out how John uses grace in other places. It wouldn't work. It doesn't work. I don't know. I don't know how John views grace because he never uses it again. Only here. Oh, she loves it. Are those peanuts? No, Necco wafers. Oh, my God. <laughs> Okay. She loves kids well, too yeah, I think she does. Okay, we got a shift in verse 15. What happens at 15? John Tessa. Now we got the Baptist introduced again, right? And what does the Baptist say? Who comes after me? Okay, the one coming after me is going to be greater than me because he was before me. Do we know that? I'm yeah, we saw that verse 1. It I'm said, coming. verse 1 and 2, it said he was before. Okay, now. Verse 16, and this is where I get really confused about this use of grace, because it seems to be a big deal in 16. You know, what's the result of the word coming in the flesh? You've got, we the all receive grace upon grace. Lord have mercy. That seems to be a big deal. I would have expected John to use, just like he used light, just like he used life, just like he used Word, just like the way he doesn't use words so much. Just like he used truth. These were things John's going to use all through his gospel. He doesn't use grace. And, and I don't know why. You know, maybe that's what I'll ask him when I see him sometime in the future. I'll say, why did you use grace? What were you thinking about with grace? You know, what? Okay, now, what is con? So Jesus, the, the, the flesh, uh, the uh, word became flesh. To what is, this, to what is it contrasted? Moses. Okay, contrasted with Moses. Moses and the law. Moses <laughs> Moses gave law, but Jesus gave grace. Jesus gave grace. And uh, and sisters, this there's a cute little poetic structure here. Um, it is called a little chiasm. Uh, because it starts with law given through uh, you, you got kind of coming in and going out. Anyway. Uh, so he, he contrasting what Moses did and what Jesus did. Uh, now, what's the relationship between the, now we're at the end of the prologue, what's the relationship between the Father and the Son? No one's ever seen God, but God, the one and only who the, at the Father's side had made him known. Okay, and now we've got two other words that are introduced that are going to be really important that we haven't seen before. What two, and then verse 18, what are the two other words that are going to be really important in the Gospel of John? We've already got a bunch the of words. One and the only? Well, one and only, not so much, but the father's father son. and son. 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 Boom, there's boom, father, boom, boom, boom. We, don't have, we haven't had those introduced yet, but they are here. So at the end of the prologue, we got father and son introduced, and the son is going to be doing what? Making known it's the father. going to be making known the father, right? You know, the, the son is going to be making known the father. Okay? And who who is going to be associated with the son as we get into the gospel? As we go to verse 19 and on, who's going to be the son in the gospel of John? Jesus. Jesus is going to be the son. <laughs> okay, okay, we're Oh, Lord have mercy. You're a pig. <laughs> I like those. Yeah. He likes these. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, you, your your granddaughter gives her these Scooby treats, these these little graham cracker things. Uh-huh. So she loves she loves Clara. Oh, she loves Clara. She goes crazy when she comes. She, you have now made a permanent friend. Uh, you know. Yeah. Next week she's going to expect me to see if I've got. Oh cream. yeah. Oh yeah. And we're going to be eating cheese later. <laughs> oh, Coco. All right. Life short, eat Well, you know. <laughs> and, I, you know, I end up saying that a lot about it. Yeah, that their lives are so short. You know, and I want her to have a good one. Uh, a okay, happy well, life. Then it's all gone. <laughs> now, what, what I do when we're, we're out of cheese, because I bring for her every day a slice of cheese, four little baby carrots because she loves carrots. But she likes cheese better. better than the carrots. And so we do the cheese first as I'm eating my sandwich. We do the cheese. 
because if not, she'll want oh. my sandwich. Uh -huh. and, and I will give her the cheese, and then I do this. Coco, I do this. And that tells her, She's not getting no, more no more cheese. No more cheese. <coughs> and, then, and then we do what? Carrot. We carrots. eat we eat carrots. <laughs> okay, next time I'll bring you treat. So, <laughs> I promise. Uh, all gone. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> all going. All, all right. So, looking at the prologue, and this is what it is. What have we learned about what's going to come? What What have we learned about the story that we're going to see when we look at the rest of the gospel? John's going to John. tell us about Jesus being the way, the truth, the life, the work, you know, the, and show the Father. Okay, he's going to connect. We know that he's going to connect Jesus to all these words that he's introduced. True, and, and good night. All of these Jesus is going to say, I, I am. am. Now, I am is kind of loaded too. It's God. Because that's the name for God. Mm -hmm. It's a go of me. I am. Yeah, I am. I so am. when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the good shepherd, I am the gate, uh, you know, I am becomes really, really important. I am the light of the world. All of those are really important in John. So we know that. So in the Gospel of John, he's going to bring this together. What else do we learn from the prologue? He's going to show God. Jesus, the Jesus is going to show the Father. That Jesus, the Word made flesh, is going to reveal the Father, is going to reveal God. So we know that, so we're going to be looking for that. What, do, anything else we see in this, in this prologue where John introduces all these ideas that he's going to develop later? So we, we understand we haven't seen God, but he is. Okay, good. That, that we haven't seen. But we can see God when we do what? Accept. accept. When we Jesus. accept and, and see Jesus. When we see Jesus, we're looking into, God's face. into, the, into the face of God. Now, that's going to be really interesting because when we look at like the Gospel of, we have of Luke, when we see God, how, where do we, of oh, the Gospel of Matthew, where do we see God? Matthew's going to view it a little different. Where do we see God in the gospel, in Luke, in John, it's definitely when we look at the face of Jesus, we're looking at the face of God. Sort of like that, sort of like that song, "Mary, Did You Know?" So yeah. thank you, the face. Oh, but where, for Matthew, when you look, where do you see God? If you want to look into the face of God, where do you look? In Matthew, you want to see the face of Jesus right now. Where do you look? The least of these, who are your your brothers and sisters in the 25th chapter. You've done it for me. You've done it for me. So it's, it, it, it's, it's slightly different. That's where you see, yeah. see God there. But in, in John, no question, we don't want to be distracted by that. In John, you see the face of God That's when you look into the face of Jesus. Because whenever I look at all of you, I can see God's glory. So mm -hmm. that, 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 that's a cool concept. Mm -hmm. Well, the, and that's, that's also in gospel. I mean, that's... Well, yeah. yeah. You know, if, it, if the least of... We're all the least. Right, right. And so... Some of us are more least than others. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why some are first. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> but yeah. least. My brother isn't, isn't the least. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, my sister said that to me one day when we were yeah. talking. My... Uh, I've never been a you know a good looking woman, but uh, my sisters were. And I said something to my one sister, and she says, "Shall I go look in the mirror?" And I said, "Why?" She says, "Because you'll be looking at the face of God." So that's know. right. There you go. That's that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I keep telling her I don't have any more. Yeah. Any <laughs> any any questions? Now I, I was this. Were you following this? Because this is poetry. This is hard. You know, interpreting poetry is kind of challenging. So if you're just hanging in there, that's that's okay. Yeah, that's you know, not me. Yeah. That's if you're hanging in there, that's that's okay. You know, all of these ideas he's going to develop later. So he doesn't. I don't think he expects anybody to leave these 18 verses saying, "Oh, well, I understand it." Because then you wouldn't need to <laughs> read, read the rest. Yes. You know, you wouldn't need to read the rest of it because you already know it. All of these he's going to develop, and he's going to develop it through story, and he's going to develop it through a lot through monologue. 
Jesus is going to do a lot of talking in the Gospel of John. Well, like a said, lot of talk. It takes a lot sometimes to get it in in here that I actually really understand what you know. Right. And uh, I can't help it; I just slow. <laughs> well, no, so I don't think it's a matter. Of, uh, you know, in in some ways, and I, I, I'll tell you, I, I think I personally believe, and I'm an old, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm old. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Uh, well, I'm old, oldish. Let's say oldish. I, I would have considered myself old thirty years ago. Uh, exactly. At this this age, the um, I think this is an incredibly exciting time to be the church. Oh, yes. And and I'll tell you why. And mo more exciting than any time, and certainly in my lifetime, uh, we we are dealing, but also the most challenging, mm -hmm. uh, the most exciting, most challenging. When, when I started doing this 35 years ago, one of the assumptions we made, and churches still make this, and, and I wish they didn't, one of the assumptions we made was we need to figure out how to bring people back to the church. That was a big deal. How do we bring people back? Which was good 1970s, 1980s stuff, because a lot of people Drifted. left. Some left because they were mad, some laugh because they were, they drift, some, a lot of reasons they, but they laugh. And so when I started, and I started in the 80s, it was how do we bring people back? How do we bring people back? A lot of churches still, when you go to meetings, how do we bring them back? How do we bring them back? Well, I'll tell you something, that's the wrong question. Mm -hmm. We're not bringing anybody back because we've got a whole generation who's never been. And, and that's, that's the field out there. Now, the, the wonderful advantage or the, the wonderful opportunity we have is when you're talking about bringing people back, when you bring people back, there was a reason they left. Therefore, you've got to overcome if being here and leaving with a reason is here, to get them to midpoint, you've got to overcome the reason they left. You know, and odds are the reason they left is still hanging around. You know, but you gotta deal with that before you're even midway. That's not meaning here. Now you got all that psychological thing, you know, how do I come back to a place I left? Man, that takes a lot of courage. I, I don't know that I would have the courage to do it, to come back to a place I left. That's hard. You know, so bringing back people is, is really challenging. You know, really challenging. But we're looking at a world where people are blank, blank slates. Slate. They're blank slates. They don't have, those folks had a negative impression of the church. A church, the church, don't matter. They had a negative impression. That's why they're not there anymore. But you're looking at generations that don't have a negative impression. They don't care. They have no impression at all. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it's interesting. One of the things I look, and I've looked at this for years and years, and when I retire, <laughs> or die, uh, you know, whichever comes first. Uh, I'd love to do more research on it. H how the church is presented in media, because it, it reflects how culture sees the people of God. It's not presented well. In, well, it's, this is interesting. In, I think in the, in the 70s and 80s, if you had the ch Christians presented at all, and they were presented a lot, uh, certainly in the 50s, they were presented a whole lot. Uh, but it, you, often it was a renegade Catholic priest who was fighting for social justice. Mm -hmm. You know, that was Christian. Or they were rigid, judgmental, kind of footloose, the preacher in footloose. Didn't like anything. You know, it was one of those two things. But you still had a lot of people presented, you know, Christians presented. You go into the 90s, and around the turn of the century. You know, you had presented less, but often they were the church lady, you know, who was really judgmental on Saturday Night Live, or just therapy sweet. You know, like the, uh, everybody loves Raymond, you know, the parents of one of the characters, they were just sugary sweet, just so sweet, saccharine sweet. You know, but that's the way they were presented. If you look at how, pre and, and we're talking about in media, you know, popular media, how Christians are presented now, often they're not at all. It's like they don't exist. And, and. Or if it, they are, it's against the social norms of today. 
and therefore they're wicked. It is. It, it's very interesting. Uh, and that's what gives us the opportunity. We are dealing with blank slates. And, and therefore, what we write on the slates is going to be up to us. we got to figure that out. Now, if we choose to write the same thing we did in the past, they're not going to come. Because they're not interested in that. We have the opportunity, though, to reach you know, people with this wonderful word of grace and love and power and hope. You know, we have the opportunity to do that without having to overcome the obstacles. Did you lie to her? <laughs> no more. That's a she, last She's been begging one. a bit and like well, staring at me waiting. <laughs> so I told her, okay, one more. Gosh, I wish, I'd, you had you been, I wish I'd been your son. <laughs> Come here, Coco. You are a mooch. You are a mooch. All right. What do we study next week? We are gonna, we're going to look at chapter 119 through 225. Okay. Chapter 119 through 225. Okay. okay. So we're going we're gonna to move up right to Nicodemus, and then we'll spend the whole time looking at the, the chapter 3, the Nicodemus story. Okay. Thank you, ladies. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time to gather and bless us as we uh, accept who you are, that, that we, can, we can understand you by looking into the face of uh, Jesus Christ. And we can also feel comfort knowing that, uh, that you're in control. Uh, and that's, that's good news. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen. amen.